Hello, hello, hey guys, Samantha here and excited to give you yet another info packed video from the GA crypto team to get everyone on board and up to speed about the crypto revolution. Today, we're diving deep into the story of a tech prodigy turned multi-billionaire, someone who coded a complex logistics software while just a teen, who hacked the web server of a major firm led by Ripple's former chief risk officer, who's dabbled as a botanist, a masseuse, and even a babysitter, and who now stands tall as one of the most influential figures in the Bitcoin sphere. Bet you wouldn't guess, but this billionaire is none other than Jack Dorsey, co-founder and former CEO of Twitter. His tale unfolds in the mid-1980s. As a child, Jack became intrigued by computing and communications. His father, Tim, who managed a local SMB producing large laboratory machines, gifted him his very first Apple Macintosh. Struggling with a speech impediment, Jack spent most of his time at their family home, engrossed in his computer and tuning into emergency police broadcasts on a radio. In a 2013 interview with CBS News, he revealed the concept of Twitter was inspired in part by these brief emergency messages he'd listened to as a kid. Jack also held a deep passion for mapping, trains, and real-time interactions. He was mesmerized by the intricate movements of objects and people on a grid. He recalls his childhood room being plastered with maps and how he could spend hours, almost entranced, studying the city layout of New York. At just 14 years old, while attempting Bishop Dubuque Catholic High School, he began to delve into dispatching and logistics. Leveraging radio communications, he developed an early graphical software that displayed real-time movements of vehicles, like taxis and police cars, on a map of his neighborhood. At 16, he started a small, informal startup offering bike courier services. Essentially, this venture served as a pretext for him to develop the necessary software to run the operation. Ultimately, the business folded due to lack of demand. In 1995, after earning his high school diploma, he was accepted to the Missouri University of Science and Technology in the quaint town of Rolla. Throughout his course, still driven by his love for interactive mapping, he stumbled upon the website of a logistics company based in New York named Dispatch Management Services. Ever curious, Jack identified a security flaw in the company's web server that, among other things, allowed access to the full email addresses of all the employees. Without hesitation, he retrieved the email of the CEO, Greg Kidd, and shot him a message pointing out the vulnerability and suggesting a fix. Impressed by the young Jack Dorsey's skills, Greg Kidd offered him a developer position in his firm. Jack accepted. He then moved to New York and simultaneously enrolled at New York University as a safety net. It's fascinating because Greg Kidd, who had just hired him for his dispatching software company, would later serve as an analyst for the Federal Reserve and, notably, become the chief risk officer of Ripple starting in 2013. Back then, Jack described himself as an introverted individual, a fan of punk rock, sporting dreadlocks, and a nose ring. Like many other tech moguls, Jack Dorsey ultimately decided to drop out of college before securing his degree. In 98, he relocated to California and co-founded a new startup with his former boss, Greg Kidd, named DNet, short for Dispatch Network. The company offered a dispatch system for various services, including parcel delivery and couriers. It was sort of a blend between Uber and Amazon, right on the web. Though the software was groundbreaking, it came to the market a few years too early. Indeed, even with a successful initial fundraising round, DNet didn't achieve the anticipated success. The dot-com bubble burst of the early 2000s would be the final nail in the young startup's coffin. Entering his 20s, Jack Dorsey found himself jobless and without a degree. He returned to his hometown in Missouri, St. Louis. He began studying botany and also trained as a master. This marked a lull in his life, a period dotted with odd jobs and fruitless ideas. It was during this time that Jack stumbled upon LiveJournal, a platform that still exists today, which lets users post their personal diaries online. Users can write brief messages and interact with others. It's somewhat a precursor to social networks, alongside the likes of Six Degrees or MSN. Originating from around the same era, Jack Dorsey created his LiveJournal account on May 31st, 2000. In July of that same year, an idea struck him to enhance the LiveJournal concept. He thought it would be cool to have an even more immediate and mobile version of this idea. He envisioned a status update system, reminiscent of AOL Instant Messenger status feature, but combined with the online sharing and interaction capabilities of LiveJournal. Without hesitation, young Jack sketched out his software idea. He named it stat.us, short for status. He coded an initial system that received messages via email and simply forwarded them to all his friends, who could then reply. 
All of this was done on an RIM 850, a precursor to the BlackBerry devices. The catch was, at the time, hardly anyone owned such a device. The widespread adoption of SMS would only come several years later. So launching an immediately mobile-based software was challenging. Thus, the idea for Twitter was born, but it would remain dominant in Jack's mind for quite some time. Years rolled by, and by 2005, Jack had a burning itch to code. As he approached his 29th birthday, he struck a deal with his former partner, Greg Kidd, a deal that would dramatically change the trajectory of his life. He agreed to care for Kidd's children in exchange for a modest dwelling located in Kidd's yard. This accommodation was akin to a shed in the Rock Ridge neighborhood of Oakland. In this way, Jack found himself closer to Silicon Valley and San Francisco, just across the famous Bay Bridge. He managed to find a few freelance developer roles. For instance, he worked on creating an online ticketing system for ferries traveling to Alcatraz Island in the San Francisco Bay. Through a series of fortuitous events, he eventually crossed paths with Evan Williams, who had just founded a new startup. Evan Williams was the man behind the renowned platform Blogger. Back in 1999, when blog posts were exclusive to a select few, he envisioned a program that could automatically convert plain text into HTML, which could then be read by web browsers. This platform set the groundwork and popularized weblogs, which were later abbreviated to blogs. Evan Williams sold Blogger to Google in 2003. Williams stepped down a year later and founded Odeo in 2004. It was a podcast platform that allowed users to listen, download, and freely publish audio files of any kind. An early version of Spotify, if you will. Jack Dorsey joined this startup in 2005 as a junior developer. Evan Williams aspired to revolutionize podcasting the same way he had done for blogging with his prior venture. But sadly, Odeo struggled to take off. They found themselves overshadowed by Apple, which had recently integrated podcasting into its iTunes software. In fact, the term podcasting comes from combining iPod and broadcasting. This term was first coined by a journalist from The Guardian in 2004. Odeo's business model was shaky. Recognizing this, Williams decided to take action. He gathered his team and organized a hackathon. The goal was to chart a new course for the company. Jack Dorsey, then just another developer on the team, still had his early idea of a mobile tool for real-time personal journaling fresh on his mind. This was the perfect moment to refine that concept. He opted to capitalize on SMS, which was growing in popularity at the time, by posting them on a website that would relay the real-time status updates of its users. Assisted by Noah Glass and Bizstone, two of Odeo's co-founders, along with developer Florian Weber, Jack Dorsey showcased the Twitter protocol in just two weeks. Glass wanted to name this new platform Twitter, but Odeo's other leaders leaned towards TWTTR, don't Twitter, ditching the vowels. One reason for this was that Twitter.com domain was already taken. Additionally, this allowed them to tap into the trend established by the then popular social network, Flickr. On March 21st, 2006, Jack dropped the first ever tweet typing out, just set up my Twitter. Come July 2006, Twitter went public. After setting up their profile, users could add friends to their network. By shooting a text to 40404, their message would automatically get blasted to their entire friend list. This whole thing was as groundbreaking as a new altcoin. Even as creators were like, what have we minted here? During a chat with INC in 2013, Evan Williams said, with Twitter, it wasn't clear what it was. They called it a social network, labeled it microblogging, but nailing it down was tough because it wasn't really replacing anything. Fast forward six months, and the big dogs at Odeo finally decided to snag the domain name twitter.com, rebranding their platform. The name would stick until July 2023, when Elon Musk decided to throw a curveball and rename it to X. Come 2006, Williams was scheming a company reshuffle. He set up a parent company to oversee the different subsidiaries, and boom, Jack Dorsey gets a CEO title for Twitter. The platform was snagging some users, but the growth was kind of like slow burn crypto nobody's hyping yet. The founders were thirsty for a breakout moment. Enter South by Southwest 2007 a mega festival in Austin, Texas. That's all about music, movies, and media. That year, Jack and his squad set up a couple of massive 60-inch screens, one at the check-in desk and the other smack in the middle of the main conference hall. These screens were streaming the Twitter feed live. Speakers at the event got tweeting and bloggers and who were swarming the place started hyping it up online. That's when Twitter really started trending. 
Beyond just being the brains behind Twitter, Jack Dorsey is a man who's all about the offbeat lifestyle. First up, his eating habits. Dude's on some next level intermediate fasting game. On the weekdays, Jack's grabbing on just one meal in the evening. And the weekend, straight up fasting. No munchies at all. He claims this trick makes the days feel longer. I mean, imagine having the willpower to scroll past all those food pics on Twitter and not have a bite. But it ain't just about food. Every morning, Jack's up at the crack of dawn and diving straight into an ice bath. A few minutes of frosty immersion is his jam for a mental edge. It unlocks something in my brain. If I can force myself to do this, I feel like I can tackle anything. That's the tea he spilled on Ben Greenfield's podcast. Meditation, big check. Jack's super into it. Every now and then, he's off on a spiritual journey. Like on his 42nd birthday, my guy dipped into Myanmar for a 10-day Vipassana meditation sesh. If you're scratching your head, Vipassana is this traditional Buddhist meditation that's all about getting deep insights and shaking off suffering. We're talking 10 hours of meditation a day, zero distractions and complete radio silence. Talk about hardcore Zen. All right, so these quirky life choices, totally a thing among the big dogs in Silicon Valley. Like, did you know Mark Zuckerberg, the dude who started Facebook, only eats meat from animals he's hunted himself? Wild, right? And then there's Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft, He's all about these off the grid weeks, just taking a break from the hustle and bustle. But some billionaires, they take it to the next level. Brian Johnson, for instance, is dropping mad cash on all kinds of meds and pills, trying to outsmart aging. Guess when you're loaded, you find unique ways to chase the fountain of youth. And before continuing, just a quick FYI, the crypto world is ever changing. So if you don't wanna get left behind, subscribe to our GA Crypto channel to always stay up to date. All right, let's jump back into Jack Dorsey and Bitcoin. So let's get to the juicy stuff, crypto. Speaking of which, Jack Dorsey is big time into it, especially when we're talking about the Bitcoin scene. By the way, we had the privilege of chatting with him about it at the Africa Bitcoin conference last December. Pretty dope, no? To get a full picture of why Jack's all into Bitcoin, we got to rewind to take a look at his killer entrepreneurial journey. After his first exit from Twitter back in 2009, Jack teamed up with Jake McKelvey and co-founded Square. The company's mission was simple, make it a breeze for small businesses to accept credit card payments. Their debut gadget, the Square Reader, with this neat little device that plugged right into a smartphone's audio jack, no pun intended with Jack's name, this bad boy could read the magnetic strips on credit cards, letting folks accept those payments without a fuss of buying a full-blown card terminal. Moving forward, Square stepped up their game by rolling out a more advanced POS system, or point of sale solution, featuring slicker, more polished card terminals. And get this, as early as 2014, Square was already letting its merchants accept Bitcoin payments without having them sweat about those wild price swings. Cool, right? So here's the scoop. Jack left Twitter in November 2021 and decided to give his company Square a fresh new name, Block. Why? Well, Block's all about bringing a bunch of businesses together under one big umbrella. And here's the rundown. First. There's Cash App, big hit in the US by the way. It started as this cool app to send money back and forth. But guess what? It's now like this digital bank. You can buy stocks, take out loans, and even snag a debit card. Oh, and if you're into crypto, since 2018, you can buy and sell Bitcoin right inside the app. And in 2022, they added this cool feature where you can send Bitcoin using the Lightning Network. Super cool. Next up, Weebly. Remember when it was just a web hosting service? Now. It's this full-blown website builder, kind of like giving Shopify a run for its money. Then there's Afterpay, which Block picked up in 2022. If you're big on online shopping, but don't want to pay for everything up front, Afterpay is your go-to. It lets you split up your payments into installments. And don't even get me started on Tidal. It's that premium music streaming platform. And fun fact, you can jam to Tidal's tracks in a Tesla. So let's talk about numbers. Thanks to all these cool ventures, Jack's net worth is hitting the charts at around a whopping $4.6 billion, according to our pals over at Forbes. Now, diving into Bitcoin, Jack's umbrella company has two major players, Spiral and TBD. Keep an eye on them, they're making waves in the crypto scene. So Spiral is all in on Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. They've been super generous, dishing out donations to fund those awesome open source devs working on Satoshi Nakamoto's brainchild. Mostly, Spiral's been diving deeper into coding projects. For instance, they're the brains behind LDK, Lightning Development Kit, 
which is like this cool toolkit that lets you add Lightning payments into just about any app. And they didn't stop there. They also introduced the BDK, Bitcoin Development Kit. It's kind of like the LDK, but it's geared towards Bitcoin on-chain wallets. And they're pushing the envelope even further, working on standardizing open source designs in the Bitcoin and Lightning scenes through their Bitcoin design project. In a nutshell, with these open source projects, Jack Dorsey's Spiral is not just pouring money into Bitcoin development, but also making it a breeze for builders to get more folks on board with this groundbreaking technology. Oh, and get this. Just a few days ago at the Baltic Honey Badger Conference, Pavel Nex, the project lead for BTC Pay Server, spilled the beans on a new mobile app they're cooking up with Spiral. The big idea? Making it super easy for merchants to accept Bitcoin without the headache of managing a node or juggling funds. Just one of the many cool Bitcoin ventures that Spiral's got their fingers in. So diving into his second crypto-focused company named TBD, their mission is, and wait for it, to create Web5. Yeah, you heard it right. Forget Web3, we're jumping straight to Web5. The big dream, pushing the internet to its next level and truly getting down to the nitty gritty of decentralization. Jack Dorsey's take, Web3, which is chock full of all crypto, blockchain, and NFT projects, might have the right intentions, but might be barking up the wrong tree. The sentimental totally vibes with what hardcore Bitcoin fans often shout from the rooftops. You don't need a blockchain for that. Now, you might be scratching your head wondering, why the jump to Web5? What happened to Web4? It's a clever play on words. See, Web5 aims to capture the essence of Web3, like decentralization, open source mojo, privacy, and self-custody, but pull it off with a toolkit from Web2, which means no blockchain. Quick math for you, two plus three equals five. Get it? To bring this much hyped Web5 to life, TBD is banking on a few key ideas. Top of the list, Bitcoin and what's known as decentralized identity, or DID for short. Their beef with the web right now? There's no solid layer for users to truly own their identification. Right now, the tech bigwigs pretty much have a monopoly on that, using and profiting off of it big time. TBD is aiming to roll out an open protocol that sets the standard, a way for folks to establish their identity online without handing over the keys to the corporate giants. Though it's got its own unique spin, this project's got vibes similar to the World ID protocol, whipped up by Sam Altman. Another cornerstone of Web5 is giving people real control and interoperability when it comes to their data. The dream, web users create their own data, stash it securely, and most importantly, decide who gets a peek and when. It kind of circles back to what Eric Hughes said in the Cypherpunks manifesto. Privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. Great, right? To pull off this Web5 vision, the TBD version is gonna stand on three big legs. Number one, wallets. These bad boys are gonna streamline interactions around DIDs and data. Number two, decentralized web nodes. Think of these as your personal digital lockers where you store your personal info. And three, decentralized web apps. They're pretty much the online services we're used to, but with a twist. They'll have the ability to tap into DIDs and those peer-to-peer -peer storage mechanisms. Now, Block didn't stop there. They've whipped up their very own Bitcoin wallet called BitKey. The cool part? It meshes with a hardware wallet that you can unlock with your fingerprint. Jack's never been a fan of the current ways we secure Bitcoin. Pins, passwords, or those BIP39 recovery phrases. In his eyes, they're not cut out for the job and can be, well, kind of confusing. And you know what? He might be onto something. A lot of the security stuff we have right now can feel like you're trying to crack the code to a bank vault. I mean, have you ever tried to secure your recovery phrase by punching those tiny metal letters one by one into a plate? I remember thinking, am I nuts? No average Joe's gonna do this. So circling back to Jack and his block team, their BitKey solution is already out in beta. And here's the kicker. It's gonna be rolled into the Cash app and get this, Coinbase. Yes, Coinbase just spilled the beans on an exclusive partnership with Block. It's exciting times ahead. All right, let's break it down. So Block isn't just dipping their toes, they're diving deep into the world of Bitcoin mining. They're also gearing up to launch their own user-friendly mining machine, boasting its unique ASIC and open source firmware. Big moves. Now, if you didn't know this already, Jack Dorsey's a huge fan of Bitcoin. 
He envisions a web of tomorrow deeply entrenched in values that resonate so well with the community. From our chat last December, he kept hammering on a few themes, self-custody, data privacy, open source endeavors, and decentralization at its core. The man's not all talk either. He's very much into supporting open source development. Just this June, he committed a whopping $5 million over five years to Brink, an organization that rolls out grants to developers. And for those wanting to learn, Jack's got a hand in that too. He's thrown in with rapper Jay-Z's Sean Carter Foundation to back the Bitcoin Academy, an initiative aimed at educating folks about Bitcoin. Long story short, Jack's far from done. He's taking a good chunk of his life on shaping a more balanced web, and he sees Bitcoin as a key player in that vision. Switching gears a bit, Jack's also pushing hard for a decentralized approach to social media. Back in 2019, when he was still at the helm of Twitter, they kicked off Project Blue Sky. The mission revamped Twitter's inner workings through decentralization. Fast forward to his 2021 exit, and Blue Sky emerges as its own entity. Now it stands as an autonomous, decentralized social network. And guess what? Jack's still in the game. He's actively involved, holding a seat on Blue Sky's board. That's pretty great. The former head honcho of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, is also pretty active on Noster, which is this other decentralized communication platform. And get this, in 2022, he donated a cool 14 Bitcoins to Fiat Japs, the brains behind Noster. And if you're curious about how this platform is shaking things up and changing the way we connect and interact with our network, you should totally check out our deep dive video on it. It's a game changer. So thanks for watching, guys. If you want to keep getting more great content to stay ahead of the curve on what's happening in the crypto ecosystem, subscribe to our channel so you won't miss out. And see you soon for the next 